Today we're going to talk about understanding game journalists. Now, it might be an interesting topic, might not be an interesting topic. One way or another, you will end up being confronted with what the press and the general media think about your games, your company, and your future employer, where you will end up making games if you choose that path. So it's important to know that, you know, sometimes it is better to have other people write about how good your games are instead of you, you know, shouting it out in public. So let's see, what are we going to talk about? You know, once again, uh, I'm going to introduce myself for who hasn't attended yesterday's lecture. Um, I'm going to talk about how we can understand the game press and what kind of interesting creatures those people are. Um, how to deal with them, you know, what, they're, what they like, what they don't like. And uh, I'm going to give you some handy tips and tricks at the end, of course, summarize everything and then let you guys ask the questions if your brain isn't so filled by this lecture <coughs> already that you, you can't do that anymore. So once again, who am I? I'm Vlad. I'm here to guest lecture at your university. <coughs> I used to be a game journalist, so I know who I'm talking about when I'm going to give this lecture. I've been there. I've done that. Yes, I've been on that side. And I've seen what there has to be seen. I've written for a lot of outlets, uh, given me a lot of opportunities to go to events, talk to developers, talk to other journalists as well, and figure out what this side of the business is all about. Now I've decided to you know, try my luck in game development because I see myself standing on the sidelines from you know, the game journalist perspective, and there is something in me that craves to uh, create and be creative. So recap. Um, we talked about that yesterday a little <coughs> bit, uh, about how press works. You guys end up talking about your game on your blogs and on game communities, and suddenly those game communities are starting to like it, are giving you feedback, may, e may even highlight you on their websites. So, um, you know, then the, the main game, big game websites pick that up, start ri writing about you, uh, start reading about you on different websites and want to do some piece on you and you know suddenly you're in the mainstream press and they're talking about how these ex excellent three Finnish guys and girls made this amazing game that reached millions of people and um, ask you what your motivations are and how you started at this little game program in Kajani. But who are these people? Who are these guys in the middle there that you know are fanatics, love games and decided to make a career of writing about them? Uh, well, basically, you know, I would put them in two different camps. There's the professional press, the, the professional game press, um, that uh, has an interest in games and actually gets paid to write about this uh, industry and about the products that come from it. And then there, of course, the majority of the press, game press, are enthusiast game press, uh, wannabe game press, and, and basically enthusiast communities that try to score, you know, uh, a bit more attention, a bit more traffic by writing about games. And, building up traffic that way. You know, one get, gets really, like one gets paid, One's, one spends a nine to five or even, you know, 12 hour job a day doing this and make a steady living out of it. The other one gets free games, goodies, and actually might make some money out of ad revenues for their website, but they do it as a passion next to their day job or might not have a background in the game industry at all. Now, they do show a lot of similarities from what I've seen. Um, there's, you know, both of them deal with the bombardment of PR and marketing once they get to this certain threshold. I think the E3 this year is letting in Game Press that has a minimum of 8,000 unique <coughs> visitors a month. I know a lot of websites that get to that minimum. And uh, it's not that hard anymore to prove yourself as Game Press nowadays towards PR and marketing. If you have numbers like that visiting your website, you actually get attention from them. But you also get bombarded with press releases and everything. Uh, both are fighting for attention and traffic. Both are trying to generate traffic that makes them an important source of information and also an important source for advertising. Because you know, eventually, you want to be sent to those lush, review events in exotic locations where the publisher invites you to spend an entire week playing their games for free and pay for everything. Um, but you know that means you have to fight for the attention and the traffic that your website generates and that other game uh, journalists are fighting for as well. Uh, we all are largely dependent of what publishers offer us. I mean, we all fight for an exclusive position at a press conference 
we all try to get into these events or the, these lush journalist trips abroad. Um, but we basically are dependent on the press releases, the screenshots, the videos, everything we get um, sent to us by PR and marketing people from game companies. And of course this results in kind of a dilemma because why should we write, why should we as game journalists write about something that does not generate traffic or that does not give us this exclusive access? Um, very little or no attention is given to indie developers and indie game, game publishers or you know independent small companies because they don't generate that kind of traffic. And you got to love these people because even though they don't have this room and they don't seem to have this time to spend on you, they actually love you. But look at this funnel real quick. Um, this is a funnel uh, closely related to the funnel I showed yesterday, which was more about you know the customers and the, the, your champions. But this one can be applied to game press as well in the source that you want people to be aware of your game. You want the press to be aware of your game. People will start getting interested. The game press might get interested in your game, but it's still a long way until them wanting to talk to you or even writing about you. So that action over there is that they actually spend their attention and their valuable traffic and time on giving you your spotlight and giving your game the attention it deserves. So here's an institutional problem with game journalism that you guys need to understand. Game journalists have a certain way of working. And if you deal with them, you have to know this. Because they are not the people who just like writing about games. So let me, let me show you this awesome rant by Brandon Boyer. Uh, he's the chairman of the IGF right now. Uh, he's a great guy. You should definitely invite him to your house when you hear that he comes, he's coming to Finland. Uh, but he gave this rant a, a year ago um, and he, that basically turned him into my hero. And I want you guys to see it. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys would have looked at this presentation and instantly thought about a couple of game websites or magazines that you might have read yourself either now or in the past. So um, let's move on with um, a different topic and that is when things go wrong in game journalism. When these people that uh, spend their time writing and reviewing games, um, you know, get some challenges and some problems of their own. Now, just a quick question. Who knows this guy? Please raise your hand. Where do you know him from? Uh, I'm not sure he, about his name, but was it he the guy who uh, uh, boasts about the Ken Lynch game? Exactly. Um, this uh, is Jeff Gersman. He is a former GameSpot uh, game journalist. Well, basically, he reviewed games, uh, as far as I know. And, um, you know, it was funny because at one certain point he was given Kane and Lynch to be reviewed, which by then I think, remember, it was an IDOS game published by IDOS. And he played the game and he actually, you know, gave it a bad review score. He gave it a six. So what's funny about this situation is that when he was reviewing the game and gave it a 6, be, while he was reviewing this game, um, his, the sales department from GameSpot signed a massive marketing deal with the marketing guys from IDAS to basically cover the entire GameSpot website in Kane and Lynch pictures and you know ads and everything. So here was this big publisher investing a lot of money in GameSpot to get, you know, to show their game. And this reviewer from their staff giving it a very, very bad grade. Now, I don't remember the entire story. You can Google it. You can look it up. But that basically, they basically forced him to raise the uh, grade to, I think, a 7 or an 8. He, I think he eventually did raise it to a 7, but not before causing a lot of commotion and controversy. He eventually left uh, GameSpot to start his own website, Giant Bomb, which I commend and I respect. Uh, it, it was a very brave thing of him to do. Remember what I said about game marketing yesterday, and if you didn't, weren't there, then you know the video is going to be online and the slides are going to be on SlideShare soon, I hope. But um, game marketing is, especially towards the game press, the, the way marketing works <coughs> is that they give the press certain things. 
And even though it's not expected of them to give something back, that's kind of an unwritten rule. If you get invited to a lush, exotic resort on the other side of the world to play five games, I think, you know, it would be reasonable for the people who invited you to expect five articles about those games. Preferably positive, of course. So don't forget, not everything has a price in this world. Nothing is for free, even if they say that it isn't. So why should you know this stuff? It's important because even though you are not in this position yet with your game or with your company, um, you will one way or another get confronted by the effects and the, you know, the aftermath of these kind of politics and these kind of workings that game journalists deal with. It's a constant struggle between marketing and press because they're the main source of advertising for game websites. So if you give the people who are feeding, your, feeding you a bad grade for their products, that's going to be awkward and that's going to cause a lot of controversy and that's walking a very fine line. A lot of journalists call themselves independent but are being literally fed by the games that they have to be critical about. That's very interesting. Aside from that, there's a lot of controversy. I mean, how do you judge a game? You judge it by a 1 to 10 scale. That's what 99% of the game websites and media outlets do. I personally am not a fan of that. I can understand why they do that. But it's interesting when suddenly Metacritic becomes a way for publishers to decide if they should continue or fire a studio with 200 people because their game was not a, did not have a good Metascore. Metascores are based on the reviews of both users and critics, and they get accumulated into this database where an average comes out. If an average of an EA game is lower than a 7, how many of you think there's going to be a sequel? Very optimistic. So you've got to understand who your real enemy here is. It's not the game journalist. I mean, this is you. And that's a random big publisher, and that's your little marketing strategy right there. If you want to make sure that both journalists support you and you get the attention you deserve. They're, they use dirty tricks. You know, I'm not going to name any names here, but I've seen a lot of dirty tricks come around. One of them, of course, is booth babes. I mean, booth babes, why are they there? They don't even talk about your game. They don't even know your game. They're just there wearing a t-shirt of it or a sexy skimpy suit. But, you know, they have lots of money and they're not afraid to use it on exclusive parties and lush journalist trips and whatever not. So we got to be smart. We got to be David. We got to find our slingshot if we want to get the same attention from game journalists that they give to these people who are giving them literally money to write about them. Um, so they have a certain power over the media. And we need to be smart in how we promote our games and we need to be smart in how we make sure to deal with game journalists because they get confronted with this every single day. Kieran Gillen, former game journalist, he now writes for comic books. He says, you know, the game press is often painted as corrupt, lazy, and as I mentioned, fundamentally stupid. This is because we tend to be corrupt, lazy, and fundamentally stupid. Yes, I have been lazy, corrupt, and fundamentally stupid because my job has forced me to. I cannot make a living working as a game journalist if I do not adhere to a, most of it, to what is going on, what kind of politics I have to deal with. I cannot go to a press conference and enjoy the luxuries that professional game journalists have without being forced and faced with the same expectancies that they get. You gotta write something. You gotta make a picture, at least but you're not going to go to one of those events and think that you can go home without doing anything for that publisher. Because they will put you on a blacklist and they won't invite you next time. Simple as that. It's an unwritten rule, but it's a rule we have to know and understand. But please, don't use their tricks. Try to avoid it, because it literally puts you in their side, on the dark side, if you would consider it that. We are creative people. We have strategies. We are smart. We are the Davids against the Goliaths. You know, read Sun Tzu's Art of War. You don't have to be the biggest warrior or the biggest army to succeed. There are millions of different strategies to circumvent that. And, you know, um, here's an anonymous person from a big publisher 
uh, from an article uh, on, on a website by, um, by a famous game journalist, uh, Mr. Sue. Uh, I have been one of those people, he said. You know, basically confirming what a lot of game journalists have discussed. Doing everything I can to get to try game journalists to place my games on the core cover of their magazines, extended previews, assets posted online, and the scores as high as possible. I have pulled ad buys in protest of what I felt were unfair review scores. I have spoken to the boss of publications before and complained about certain journalists. I have banned certain media outlets from getting pre-release access to games because of previous unfavorable coverage. That's the way it works, folks. Behind closed doors, game journalists are constantly forced in awkward, into awkward situations, very unpleasant situations that make them doubt their own moral values. And sadly, we sometimes fall and leave behind our own beliefs and moral values because there needs to be bread and butter for our families. Here's another example, uh, Joseph Bernstein sharing uh, this experience in an article on Ki in Kill Screen magazine on their website. If you don't know Kill Screen, you better go online and figure out how to get an, a subscription for your uh, game uh, development program. Uh, you can just nudge VP and I'll make sure to do that too. Here's a story of Joseph Bernstein getting a group of THQ people at his office. He says, at the end of the 20 minute presentation, the man who was in charge, or at least who talked the most, held out a large glossy folder emblazoned with the THQ logo. Everything you need is in here, he said. Here was my preview, Bernstein realized. My qualification was the ability to publish information about MX versus ATV Untamed without a THQ watermark. So then I had an even worse thought. I was not the author of the piece I was about to write. And my God, that is so true. So wake up and smell the coffee. Game journalists are constantly faced with a lot of difficulties, both moral, financial, material. They love you. They want to write about in the game, independent game uh, developers, about you know, game development students who have this awesome project that could possibly reach millions of people. But then again, like a good friend and one of my other mentors on the research side of things, David Niebuhr, uh, found in a research on game journalism that you should read, which is in the back at the references, is that the job of a game journalist consists in many ways of balancing acts between a perceived loyalty to the reading public and a dependence on industry material.